Well, I just want to wish you a very good morning. And Barbara and I and Scott are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. Barbara, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's I'd, study? I'd be happy to. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful, Lord, that we can come to you today, this, your blessed Holy Sabbath, and be in your word. Lord, today we're going to look at the worldview, the biblical worldview, Lord. And so we just pray that you would open our hearts and minds to those things that you would have us to know, that your spirit would guide us, and that in all things you are glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The uh, memory text, the key text for this morning's Sabbath school lesson is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23. I'm just going to read the verse. Um, we will handle some of it uh, later on. Uh, and this is how Paul writes. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a verse that is uh, pregnant with a lot of meaning. And, um, and so for, um, as an overview to this week's lesson, a brief overview, here's a, what I would like to, uh, uh, to, to, to really talk about. The book of Revelation speaks of two major globalizations prior to the second coming of Christ. Revelation 13 describes the globalization of era uh, when all the world will marvel and follow the beast from the sea, as we read in Revelation 13.3. Revelation 14 highlights the globalization of truth when the everlasting gospel will be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, as we read in Revelation 14.6. During these distressing times, and I'm referring to the times we live in just prior to Christ's second coming, Paul tells us as we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14, that every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of this deceitful plotting, will be preached. And as Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4, people will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. Among these myths is the Greek philosophy of dualism, which assumes or suggests that the body is bad, but the spirit is good. The biblical worldview counters the Greek philosophy of dualism. Dualism claims that in a mortal body, an eternal soul is enslaved, which can only be liberated when a person dies, at which point he or she will live eternally. This view contradicts the plain biblical teaching that God created everything very good, including our bodies. We were created to depend upon God. Therefore, we were made without inerrant immortality. The life we have is a gift from God. And as we live in close relationship with God, this life is maintained forever. As we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God made human beings as living souls. Here's what the Bible says. And the Lord God formed man in, uh, of the dust of the ground. And we're talking about bones, flesh, and blood. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that's life given to that body. And man became a living being. Immortality is not in us. Our life is supplied to us by God. It comes from the Lord himself. The biblical worldview of human nature is a unity of all the components and aspects of our own existence. Let's review that, these very briefly. That's the physical being, the mental, the intellectual being, the emotional, our ability to choose, in other words, choice, the spiritual being, 
and the social aspects that are within us. These components do not exist separately or independently from each other. All these components and aspects are put together by our Creator God in a marvelous and unseparated unity. And every aspect thereof, everything we are, needs to be sanctified by God as expressed by our memory verse, the verse that we read when we began. When a person dies, there is no activity in any of these components and aspects of life as we, as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. And here's what, what this scripture says. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Pay attention to verse 6. It says, also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished, nevermore will they have a share in anything done under, under the sun. In the Great Controversy, page 588, Ellen White tells us that through the two great eras, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness or Sunday worship, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former and we're talking about the immortality of the soul, lays the foundation for spiritualism. The latter, Sunday sacredness, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. Our being is a complete unit, which God desires to transform and sanctify. To achieve this transformation, God speaks to us through His Word and through His Spirit. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 347, Ellen White stresses that the Lord communicates with us through our brain. Here's what she says. The brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to men and affect his innermost life. It is very crucial to have the mind of Christ in order to understand God's will and God's Word. You see, when the Word of God dwells in us and constantly guides us, then our mind can be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Steps to Christ, page 109, Ellen White writes, We can attain to an understanding of God's Word only through Illuminate, uh, through, through illumination of that spirit by which the word was given. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Paul in Romans chapter 12 verses 2 gives us the following counsel. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this week, this week's lesson encourages us to remain firm in our belief in all the truth that we have, which includes the nature of humanity and death, as we are guided by the Holy Spirit with the purpose of being ready for Christ's glorious appearing. Let's stay in the truth. Scott, explain why Jesus is our perfect model. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for that great introduction. In fact, I think I was going to touch on some of the things you've said, but we'll, we'll get it back around to that. So Jesus is the perfect model, and I think Loma Linda's model, which was to make man's, man whole, was Jesus' goal as well, and I've adopted right. that for myself, and I try to teach that to my kids too. Uh, my patients and to anyone who will listen. I think that um, the other universities had this biopsychosocial model, but I think they were missing the spiritual component, which Amen. maybe is a, a good thing from them because it might be the wrong spirit. spirit exactly. But um, the lesson points out that Jesus in this verse here, which they quote um, 
Luke 2.52, which is a rather brief verse, and I hadn't really divided into those four things, but it's interesting that it has those things. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So um, the lesson explains that Jesus increasing in wisdom was his mental or psychological development. His stature was his physical or biological development. In favor with God, that's his spiritual development, and with men, his social development. So I think these are good goals to live by, both as individuals, as a church, uh, and as well as for our educational institutions and even for society at large. Um, with our busy lives, it's easy to neglect some of these aspects. So uh, some of the things that I've done to try to incorporate this um, four-pronged um, four pronged approach to um, Christianity as well as to wholeness is... Uh, for example, I try to incorporate my listening to my um, Bible, either Bible itself or the spirit of prophecy or inspiring sermon while I go running or biking. or So then I'm, I'm, I'm doing the physical and the mental development and the spiritual development all at once. Uh, and then um, for the mental development, I also like to listen to, besides the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, to listen to uh, audio books that I think are a good way of improving your mind as long as they're wholesome books. And um, then I also listen to books that deal with other aspects. So I think those are also a way of growth. And then also spending time with people here at the church as well as in my other aspects and try to teach some of these principles. Um, and then in Matthew 4.23, we see that Jesus healed a great multitude. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So um, Jesus was not only practicing these things for himself, but he would also um, look outwards towards ministry, towards others. And I think much of Jesus's... Um, time on earth was spent doing good for others. Um, and then I liked what the, um, what the lesson had to say here. He says, his mind was active and penetrating with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb, a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. I think that's a great model for all of us, that we, we, we should be firm on our principles, but yet very... Um, courteous and unselfish in, in, in our actions. Um, and then um, the lesson also mentions the Romans 8, 1 to 11, and it says here in Romans, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous uh, requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." For those who live to the flesh and set their minds on things of the flesh, uh, but those who live according to the Spirit, for the, for the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is empty against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then... 
Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is not in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And now it seems like a very subtle distinction here in these verses between the dual nature that we have, so the nature, the carnal nature and the spiritual nature, because he's essentially saying that the spirit, spiritual nature is good and it tends upward and our fleshly nature is bad and tends downward, which sounds very similar to the dualism, but the dualism of the Greeks Basically, well, here, here I'll just read it the way. But so Aristotle and the ancient Greeks taught that uh, dualism was where your body is bad and your separate soul, which is good, uh, and at death the soul leaves or is liberated from the body, and then you're all good. So uh, I think the difference this makes is that um, in this verse that Paul says, for to be car carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Uh, that sounds similar, but there's a great distinction. And the, the big distinction is that the Greek tendency of the, the teaching of the Greek tendency tends to be towards disregarding the, the physical body and thinking of it as unimportant and fo focusing just on the spiritual nature. But I think the Paul's teaching is one that tends to lead people obedience to God's law because um, when you are spiritually minded, your body is under the subjection of the spiritual nature. So a subtle distinction, but a very important one. So sort of like the, dis the difference between the way um, Lucifer quoted scripture uh, to Jesus in order to get him to sin because he says for it is said that you will not dash your foot against the stone uh, but Lucifer was using that for presumption to say cast yourself off this pinnacle of the temple so Christ was able to see through that deception but um, a lot of people don't see through that so they they end up with this um, dualistic type theory um, and so I think we have to learn to be spiritually minded, but our, our body has to be in subjection to our spiritual nature. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much, Scott, for that. The reality is when, when the human nature takes over, it affects the physical, the mental, the intellectual, the emotional, the choice of our spiritual being. So, so absolutely nothing <coughs> like the... the what they, you know, what the Greek philosophy talks about dualism, nothing about that. Barbara, uh, Monday's lesson is particularly important because it refers to your body and my body and Scott's body and our body as a temple. It does. Right. And so that discredits the Greek philosophy. Go ahead. Well, and some other philosophies as well, because right. there are various philosophies out there with this dualistic theory. As, as Scott mentioned, the Greek philosophers looked at the human body as more of a prison for the soul, uh, which, was liber which is liberated at death. Um, and this is very similar to the pagan concepts of what happens to the soul. Many Christians today believe that the, that the body is a temporal housing for the immortal soul, uh, which will be regenerated when the body is resurrected. So what th the belief basically is that your soul goes to heaven, your body remains on the earth, and then when Christ returns, he brings the soul back to reunite it with the body to go back to heaven. Then we have the pantheists out there who look at the human body um, as, a, as divine. They believe that God and the universe 
are one and the same. So there's really no difference between the body and the soul. <clears throat> the pantheistic belief does not recognize a distinct personal God, but worship of all God in every religion. So in pantheism, all, all is one, all is, all is good. For them, all things are God, and the human body is part of one single, integrated, universal divine substance. When you die, there is no afterlife, but you become part of nature or part of matter. So, surrounded by all this conflict and confusion and theories out there, where do we get our answers? And as Christians, we know that we have to go to the Bible to get our answers. And so God tells us our bodies are precious and we should understand them as such. So let's look at three scriptures here that tell us the importance, how important it is to God, how we treat these bodies. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. And which temple are you? So if we look at our bodies, God wants us to keep them in whole and healthy as, as he wants to dwell within us. And only can we hear him when we're whole and healthy. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a the price. Therefore, I, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. In these verses, it's important for us to realize that God cares about us and how we honor him by treating our bodies as temple in which he, he can live and where the Holy Spirit can work to bring us into oneness with Christ. So both Adam and Eve were created in God's image and in his likeness. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let, us, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created the, the, he them. So it's an honor for us to be able to be created in the likeness of God. Everything else that was created on this earth was not in God's likeness. But man, he created uh, special. I see him just carefully crafting man from clay and breathing into his his nostrils, the breath of life. So, um, so we re this is reflected not only in our character, but in our physical aspect. Because that image was marred and even hidden by the presence of sin, the work of redemption is to restore human beings, including their physical health to their original condition, to the degree possible for beings unable to partake of the tree of life. The work of this life is to prepare for heaven. And that's why we're here. It, sometimes we forget that this earth is not our home, but heaven is our home. And our work is to prepare ourselves for heaven. It's kind of like when we go to a foreign country. If, if we're getting ready to go overseas or somewhere, we, we plan, don't we? We plan what to take, we plan if, if there's going to be a problem with the water, how are we going to get water, what, what, what about the foods, where are we going to stay. So we plan when we're, when we're getting ready to travel. It's the same with heaven. We need to plan. And so uh, if we look at this restoration, it's a lifetime process that will be completed only at Christ's second coming. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 54 says, For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible puts on the incorruptible and this mortal has immortality, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So we see also in 1 Corinthians 10.31, therefore whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So we need to remember that we still live in a world where good people can do their best and yet suffer consequences of a sinful human nature and a sinful environment. So we should trust in God and do our best, and we will leave the results with God. Ellen White sums it up this way in Councils on Diets and Food. Men will never be truly temperate until the grace of Christ is a, an abiding principle in their heart. Circumstances cannot work reforms. Christianity proposes a reformation in the heart. What Christ works within will be worked out under uh, the dictation of a converted intellect. The plan of beginning outside and trying to work inward will always fail. It has failed and it will always fail. God's plan is to begin at the very seat of all difficulties, the heart, and then from out of the heart, the issue of principles righteous and the reformation will be outward as well as inward. Thanks so much, Barbara. And how, how relevant it is for us to really <coughs> acquire the mind, the mind of Christ. And that's really what Tuesday's lesson is all about. You know, Tuesday's lesson appeals to us to acquire the mind of Christ. The writer of this lesson correctly states that some people believe that by changing the environment, and for that matter, culture, the individual will be transformed. And I agree that we definitely should avoid places of circumstances that can make us more vulnerable to temptation. After all, the Bible, as we read in Proverbs uh, chapter 5 and Psalm 1, is in full agreement with this counsel. Uh, here's what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1. It says to us, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor seats in the seat of the scornful. Great advice. However, our problem with temptation and sin can only be solved by the transformation of our hearts, which includes also our minds. Jesus Christ touched the core of the issue when he stated in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then he, he spells these, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. This means that our minds need to be transformed in order for our behavior to be changed. The Lord wants our minds and hearts transformed, and He is willing and ready to help us achieve just that. You know, God promised, as, as we read in Jeremiah and Hebrews, Jeremiah chapter 31, Hebrews uh, chapter 8 and chapter 10, God promised that under the new covenant, and you and I are living under the new covenant, He would put His law in the minds of His people and would write them in their hearts. This, prom this promise, um, and so let's read uh, the promise in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33, and this is what it says. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. God is making that covenant with you and I. The house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and, I will, and uh, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In the, ser in the Sermon of the Mount, and that's found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 48, Christ broadened and deepened the meaning of God's commandments to the level of thought and intention. Now, I'm not going to read that. I just don't have time. But I, I, would, um, I would really encourage you to read Matthew 5, 17 to 48. When our thoughts and intentions are in tune with God's commandments, God's transformation, 
transforming grace is going to help us gain victory over temptation and sinful thoughts. So what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Let's read a few verses in Scripture. Let's read Scripture. Scripture provides the answer. The first verse I want to read is, is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 14. Paul says here, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In this verse, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that every believer should be a spiritual person. Dr. Scott made that particular point uh, on Sunday's lesson. We can have the mind of Christ only when we discern spiritual things spiritually and are guided by the Spirit of God. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 16. It tells us, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So Paul says, so who's instructing you? If we have the mind of Christ, who's instructing you? So you see, when God's Spirit becomes the dominant force in your life and in my life, we can have glimpses into God's mind so that we may know His thinking and have the mind of Christ. Let's go to Psalms. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, asks the psalmist, or who may stand in his holy place, God's holy place? Verse 4, he provides an answer. He says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, no sworn deceitfulness. So when we commit our lives to God, God takes control of our heart and produces in us purity of thought and sincerity of motive, and we will have the mind of Christ. Let's read Romans 12.12. 12. Paul here in Romans 12.12 12 tells us, uh, uh, 12 verses 2, tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, when we commit our lives to God, our minds, our, our being comes under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The renewal of the mind enables us to know what God would have us do. And as such, we will have the mind of Christ. A couple more verses I want to read for you. Philippians. These are both in Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8. Paul tells us, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, says Paul. In other words, when my character is developed and transformed by Christ through the Holy Spirit, our minds will focus on positive virtues. This will reflect the mind of Christ. And then in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, Paul tells us, let this mind be in you. He's talking about Christ's mind. Let Christ's mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This mind that Christ had is really God's mind. Paul tells us here that when we have the mind of Christ, we have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. We will think and act the way Christ would, and we will be reflecting Christ's character. While here on earth, you and I will always be struggling with sinful natures until Jesus comes. But as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, 12 to 15, and I'm not going to read it, if we are in Christ, we are fully covered by His, by His righteousness. And although we are not yet perfect, if we have the mind of Christ, we are considered already perfect in Him. In Selected Messages, book 1, page 337, Ellen White tells us, when we are united with Christ... We have the mind of Christ. Purity and love shines forth in the character. Meekness and truth controls the life. The very expression of the countenance is changed 
or your attitude, the way you feel. Christ abiding in the soul exerts a transforming power, and the outward aspect bears witness to the peace and joy that reigns within. Only by a daily surrender, a daily death to self, a daily de determined effort by faith to be obedient to Jesus, can we have this kind of transformation in our, in our, in our bodies, in our souls, our mind. Scott, guidance of the Spirit. This is, I think, a very important um, lesson, the guidance of the Spirit. And I think if I had to summarize this lesson in one sentence, it would be that the Spirit guides us. We do not guide the Spirit. Um, and so now we'll kind of unravel this. So in the lesson, it talks about four aspects of what the Spirit is doing. It says this Holy Spirit is God powerful agent who, number one, pours out the love of Christ into our hearts. And the verse they quote is, now, uh, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Number two, it says that it leads us into a true saving experience. And that's um, the quote for that is John 16, uh, 7 through 11. It says, but now I go away to him who sent me and none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I, if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, uh, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. However, the Spirit of Truth, uh, however, when He, the Spirit of Truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak and He will... Um, tell you all things to come. So uh, w one interesting part, it says the Spirit will not speak on His own authority. So I think this is also uh, a warning against um, any other spirit that should teach anything different than what Christ taught. So Christ is basically saying, if it's a spirit that's telling you to do something contrary to what I said, it's not my spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's a different spirit. And so I think that's the way to know, because I was thinking that seems like it would be limiting the Spirit in some way, but it's not limiting the Spirit, because the Spirit and Christ and God the Father, they all agree. Um, and so therefore, it's not a limitation on the Spirit, it's a limitation on people trying to counterfeit the Spirit. Um, and so, um, let's see, and then it says... Um, he guides us into and then empowers us to fulfill the gospel mission. And the quote from that was from verse uh, Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit had come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Um, and I believe this gift of the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift that um, anyone could give which is what Christ asked for his disciples. But I think, interestingly, I think it's also synonymous with the gift that Solomon, when he asked for wisdom from God, he was really asking for the Holy Spirit. And Elisha, when he asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, he was also asking for the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I think then there's also a warning, which is that uh, the Spirit cannot be used by us. So unlike some of the movies today where there's some kind of magical stone or amulet or, or some, some magical instrument that you can use to control the world. Uh, um, the Holy Spirit cannot be used by us to control the world. The Holy Spirit uses us to do such things. So, so God is much more wise than to put unlimited power at the hands of sinful people. Yet I think every apostate religion 
has made an effort in order to use the Spirit of God for their own gain, um, such as, I guess one example would be the indulgences. So the, the Catholic Church was claiming that if you paid some money to the church, um, then God would forgive you your sins, which is directly contrary to what the Bible would say. And in fact, I think there was somebody in the Bible who tried to do this. So let's read about Simon the Sorcerer. It says, um, let's see. And now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying, ha laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone whom I lay my hands on might receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray that if God perhaps, uh, pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord that none of the things you said may have may come upon me. So uh, the point is, is that um, God's Spirit cannot be used to our financial advantage or to any other advantage. He, he's not um, for sale, so to speak. So, so that's why I think it was such a dangerous um, idea of what Simon was trying to do. And, and God clearly rebuked him for this. Um, so then, uh, going back to this, um, Acts 8, 4 to 24, therefore those who went, uh, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them and multitudes, uh, with one accord heard the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits crying with the loud with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lamed were healed and there was great joy in that city so it it sounds like here uh when when the spirit of god is in control um the unclean spirits will flee and also health problems will be healed and miracles will be wrought so it's a very powerful thing to have the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, you cannot um, hold a spirit of uh, selfishness or a, a, a spirit of uh, looking for money or for your own things, or else you're going to follow the same example of Simon, who who was clearly rebuked by um, by Peter here, um, and then. I think I wanted to also add in addition to this that um, the reason for the Holy Spirit is made clear in the Great Commission, which is found in Matthew 8, 28, 18 through 20, which says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then I wanted to end with um, a quote here from the Acts of the Apostles. It says, when, when Christ gave his disciples the promise of his Spirit, he was nearing the close of his earthly ministry. He was standing in the shadow of the cross with a full realization of the load of guilt that was to rest upon him as the sin bearer. Before offering himself, as the sacrificial victim, he instructed his disciples regarding a most essential and complete gift which he was to bestow upon his followers, the gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of his grace. I will pray the Father, and he, uh, he said, and he shall give you another comforter, 
that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth in you and he shall be in you. The Savior was pointing forward to the time when the Holy Spirit should come to do a mighty work as his representative. The evil that had been accumulating for centuries was to be restrained or resisted by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Um, Barbara, th this lesson has been tremendous. And very quickly, Jesus is the model. Our bodies that were well made are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We really need the Holy Spirit in order to have a transformation of mind, to have the mind of Christ. And when we have the mind of Christ, we will be ready to do what? For his appearing. We will be ready for his appearing. But this lesson on his appearing is a strong worded caution to us living in this Amen. world today. I'm in agreement with you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very strongly worded. And so <clears throat> we need to, to keep that in mind to be ready. Everything in our world is fast paced. We have fast food, we have fast everything in this world. And Satan uses this to his advantage. And this is something that we need to, gu to guard against in, ma in, in matters of this life. Because if we're not careful, we're in danger of looking away from the Lord and dwelling on worldly and carnal things <clears throat> that in the end cannot ultimately satisfy us and in the end can lead us to spiritual ruin. Uh, 2 Peter 3.14 says, Therefore, beloved, look forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. John 3, 1 to 3 says, <clears throat> Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it does not know him. And we think about that. Instead of preparing for heaven, time is now spent preparing <clears throat> to live in this world. So often, if we don't keep our focus on Christ. <clears throat> his, Christ has delayed his coming. And it might be years before he, his return. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah. I, I, I had a friend recently say, you know, it's been 170 years since Christ uh, since, since people thought Christ was coming. Why do we think now? And so we have to, we, 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 we need to be focused and, and not be concerned on today's matters. And um, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he re is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So often the notion of an ongoing preparation for the second coming becomes this excuse for procrastination. The no this notion can easily lead to relax under um, this evil, evil servant assumption. And we see this evil ser servant assumption in Matthew 24, 48. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master delay his coming. Psalms 95, 7 and 8 says, he is our God and we are his, the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the trial of the wilderness. Remember, the children of Israel spent a lot more time in the wilderness because of the hardness of their hearts. Hebrews 3, 7, 8, and 15 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in rebellion. <clears throat> uh, Hebrews uh, 4, 7 says, Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after which a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you hear the voice, do not harden your hearts. So we see this, we see this three times here, don't harden your hearts. So 
I don't know if you've had the opportunity to talk to those who love God and the reactions that you get when you, you start speaking about the overwhelming signs of Christ's soon return. Rather than being watchmen and heralding the message of Christ's soon return, um, people often become dismissive or even aggressive in op opposition. A reg regular comments you hear um, is, well, Christ has delayed his coming, why now? Or um, we don't know the time or the hour. And so we hear these, these different comments be being said. Uh, and further, unless a major conversion experience takes place, we will continue to be what we are right now. Time itself does not convert the unconverted. If anything, unless one continually is continually growing in grace and pressing on ahead in the faith, the tendency would be to fall away and to become hard-hearted hard and skeptical. First Thessalonians says, But you, brethren are not in darkness so that this day should take you as a thief. You are sons of light and sons of day. You are not of the night nor the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. For those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. So God says, be sober, be vigilant. Matthew 24, 43 says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Matthew 16, 3 says, and in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. And this is harsh, hypocrites. You know how to discern the day, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. So God expects us to know the signs of the times. He expects us to know the signs of his coming. And Ezekiel uh, 33, 1 through 6 says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman when he sees the sword coming upon the land. If, it, if he blows the trumpet, he warns the people. And so as we go on in this, it's, it's, it, it becomes even more sobering. For whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning if the sword comes and takes away, his blood shall be upon his own head. If he heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and take the person among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require on the watchman's hands. So in conclusion... Uh, this, is, this, is, this is sobering. God expects us to know the signs of his coming, he, and he expects us to share that with others. Uh, Christ Object Lesson says, the fact that man is not a hypocrite does not make him any less uh, really a sinner. When the appeals of the Holy Spirit come to the heart, our only safety lies in responding to them without delay. When the call comes, go work today in my vineyard, do not refuse the invitation. Today, if we hear the voice, harden not your hearts. It is unsafe to delay obedience. You may never hear the invitation again. If you cultivate faithfully the vineyard of your soul, God is making you a laborer together with himself, and you will have a work to do, not, to do, not only for yourself, but for others. In representing the church as a vineyard, Christ himself, yourself, but others, in representing the church as a vineyard, Christ does not teach that we are to restrict our sympathies and labor to our own numbers. The Lord's vineyard is to be enlarged in all parts of the earth. He desires to 
it to be extended. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. Scott, really appreciate your participation in this lesson. I'm going to, as, as I think in terms of final thoughts, I'm going to summarize very briefly what, the, what we've done. And the reason I'm doing this is because I really honestly believe that we, as, uh, as Christians, we need to stand, we need to place our beliefs on a foundation that is totally based on sola scriptura. And I'm talking about the ex exclusiveness of scripture. On matters of doctrine and practice, we need to allow the Bible, the Word of God, to define the understanding of human nature and the state of death. See, the biblical worldview is centered on God and His character. The view asserts that God is the creator and sustainer of the whole universe. We read that in Genesis, in John, in Hebrews. If God is the the creator of the universe and of human beings, we cannot bring God, God down and confuse it with his creatures. He's not like us, as the New Age perspective asserts. As a loving God, God tells us in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse, verses 11, that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God has no pleasure in death. As a righteous God, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. This is a caring God. Therefore, the dualistic notion that the souls of the wicked will, uh, will be punished throughout eternity for the sins they have committed during their earthly, earthly lives does not reflect God's loving and righteous character. That simple. A biblical worldview also provides a clear understanding of our human nature. As we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible tells us that God formed, formed, formed us of the dust of the ground and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became a living soul. He took his hands and his breath, and we became a living soul. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 20, God tells us that the soul who sins shall die. You know, these statements underscore the concept that each person is an integrated whole, a complete being. And consequently, they disprove the dualistic theory that the human being is formed by a mortal body and an immortal soul that remains conscious after the body's death. The great, the great cosmic uh, controversy between good and evil provides the framework for biblical worldview. This framework helps us understand, as we read in Psalm 92, verses 15, that the Lord is just and there is no evil in God. Or as we read in Psalm 145, verses 17, that the Lord is righteous in all His ways and only in all his works. This means that evil is not concerned with God. Uh, with God. The Bible make, makes it clear that evil had its mysterious beginning. And if you read the Revelation 12, verses 7 and 9, or Isaiah verses 14, 12 to 15, the Bible explains how it began. And the Bible also makes it clear that evil will have an emphatic end and the God's triumphant action, when all unrepented sinners will be consumed by fire at the second death. And Revelation 20, verse 6 tells us, Blessed and all is he who has part in the first resurrection. And I hope that you and I will have part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You and I have the privilege to serve with God during the millennium. Revelation 21.8 tells us, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, the murderer, the sexually immoral, the sorcerer, the idolater, and all the liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death after the millennium. 
I'm just delighted that the Bible pro provides a biblical worldview of human nature and human experience that offers hope for a better tomorrow. Really am. I want to hand uh, this summary, my final thoughts, with a, quot a qu quotation from Ellen White, which comes from Maranatha, page 20, uh, two, 220. Maranatha, page 220. The great controversy, controversy is nearing its end. That's how Ellen White says. And if you and I understand what's happening every day, you would agree with her. Every report of calamity by sea or land is a testimony to the fact that the end of all things is at hand. She goes on to say, wars and rumors of wars declare it. Is there a Christian whose pulse does not beat with quickening action as he anticipates the great events opening before us? Do you feel emotionally that God is at the door? She, she ends with a statement. The Lord is coming. We hear the footsteps of an approaching God. Are you hearing God's footsteps. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, you have provided the Holy Spirit. You've, the Holy Spirit is available to really work within us and transform us to become who you want us to become. Lord, you have left behind your word in 66 books. And we have the word available to read. And Lord, not only to read, but to research and understand. And Lord, throughout the word, you have encouraged us to prioritize a relationship with you so that we could have your heart, your mind. And Lord, be diligently following your precept and your instruction. Father, you are at the door. We can begin to hear the footsteps of your coming. Help us and prepare us to meet you. So, Lord, as you approach earth, we can rise to meet with you and be elevated to the new Jerusalem that you have prepared for all of us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your amazing grace. For I pray and ask in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.